Uh, I had heard a joke recently um, where they were saying everybody agrees that human life is worth more than the life of a fish, but nobody says that one human life is worth the life of all fish. So he says, at some point, there is a certain number of fish that you would prefer to be alive than that annoying coworker that you have. <laughs> It was a random, it was just a very random joke, but it got me thinking, is like, what is the cost of a human life? And so, I looked it up, because apparently you can find answers to anything. And they said that, on average, you can sell an entire human body for $550,000, which is a lot of money for a three-bedroom house in the cities. <laughs> but then, for our verse today, it got me thinking about how much was a human life worth in the Bible. And apparently they say $397.80. That's the price for 30 pieces of silver in today's market. So the section we're looking at is Mark 14 verses 10 through 11, where it's focusing on Judas. But it's important to think what was happening in this verse before this. So in this section, we see Mary had just recently dumped an entire container of oil onto Jesus's head and that starting with Judas they were upset with her because this is a year's worth of provisions this is a year's um, pay worth of oil that you just dumped on his head like why would you do this we could have taken this money and given it to the poor well John in his gospel also tells us that Judas was the one who was in charge of the coin purse and that he was the one who had been siphoning off from the top of that coin purse to fill his own pockets. So it's not a far stretch to think if they had gotten that oil, where would it have ended up instead? Probably Judas's pocket. But why? Where does that lead into us? Where does that lead us from here? Well, we see that Judas has a pattern that he's been following. He's been taking money from the apostles, slowly, slowly, and then he's taking more and more and more money. And this is important for us to see because in this verse, we see that he sought a way to conveniently betray Christ, which is a huge thing to do, but it also started significantly earlier than that. It started with those little habitual sins, those little things, it's like, oh, it's just a couple of coins from the top. It'll be okay. And he gets used to that, just that small habitual sin. And it makes it easier and easier to say yes to the sins that follow that one. So you don't start by betraying Christ. You start small. And then it slowly builds up from there. Um, it also says that he sought to betray Jesus conveniently. So he didn't go into this with a plan. He didn't say, he's like, you know what? Once we finally get to the garden, I'm going to round up all of the soldiers and then we're going to go straight in there. And I'm going to tell them who it is. No, he didn't have a plan. He was just waiting to see what was convenient for him, what would be the easiest way to betray Christ. And then he was going to go with that one, which is an attitude that we can also have in our own lives. We're not going out of our way to sin. We're not going out of our way to conveniently betray or to betray Jesus in some grand, extravagant way all the time. We're looking for those little convenient ways to sin. It's like, well, I should, probably shouldn't make a joke like this because it's a little bit of an off-color joke, but everybody would think it's funny, so I'm gonna say the joke. It's not a hard thing to do, but we're can betraying Christ in those tiny, convenient ways for us. We give up our dignity for the little small things in life. But over time, those small things get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually we don't even recognize where we ended up. So it's important for us to take a step back and say, what am I doing? Am I doing this for the right reasons? Or am I doing this because it may be wrong, but it's convenient for me? In the life of a Christian, it's important to not rely on our own understanding, but take a step back and say, you know what? I've been messing up a lot recently. It hasn't been big things. I haven't done the worst of the worst possible sins, but I haven't been reflective on my own life. I haven't taken a step back and said, Lord, 
I trust on your understanding on this. I trust your will in this. Now I'm going to stop relying on what I think is the best way to move forward from here. And it's important for us to take those times of reflection because as Christians, we have quite the enemy who's against us. In 1 Peter verses 5 and 8, a verse that everybody has probably heard, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around you like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil is going to make his mark, most notably, in the lives of Christians, which isn't something that we normally think about too much. It starts with those tiny, habitual sins, telling us to say yes to those small wrong things because it makes saying yes to the larger wrong things easier. And the devil is going to press on Christians for that more. You're not going to have pressing against pagans as much or people who don't believe in God because there's nothing to convince with that. He is already one on those instances. So it's better to focus your attention on people that you want to draw away from Christ. One of those places that we see that at, and that we actually saw that more recently, how many of you guys have heard of the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast? No? One. All right. <laughs> so there's a church, a very famous evangelical church called Mars Hill. And it very, very slowly degraded from a church where the preacher was strong and passionate about Christ. And then you start getting those tiny little abuses that show up, those abuses of power, his ego getting just a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, pushing people towards the wrong kind of gospel. So if your experience with church was Mars Hill, you can start out in one way and then by the end of what's happening, by the time the church gets shut down, you don't even recognize what kind of gospel is being preached there anymore because it's those tiny, insignificant things that will add up over time. And it's important for us in our lives to take that step back, to not rely on our own understanding, to not fall into those tiny, habitual sins, to look reflectively at your life and say, okay, God, I don't know where I'm going, but I know what I want to end up as. I know I want to end up with you. So what is my salvation worth? Is it worth $397? Is it worth $550,000? Or is it completely priceless because you have paid that entire price yourself? And I refuse to walk down this road anymore. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, be with us, every single one of us, as we look for your will in our lives, as we look for your message in our hearts. Lead us on your path and help us to not rely on our own understandings, but to rely on your strength when times get tough. To rely on your strength when we aren't sure where to go and we don't know if we have enough for it. Let us trust in you and have faith in you all the days of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.